All right, I want you to turn or flip or open or whatever you do with your Bible. Um, we're going to be in Luke 1 and 2 and Matthew 1 and 2. So we're going to be talking about Christmas. And I've never preached this message before, and we're actually thinking about making it into a little gift book next Christmas because I just feel like the revelation is phenomenal in this message. Uh, it's called The Seven Words of Christmas. And years ago, I just happened to notice that God gave seven prophetic words around the birth of his son. Just seven different people either received a prophecy or gave a prophecy right around the birth of his son. And I just thought about that, seven people. You know, and seven's the number of completion. It was like a, a confirmation of his son's birth. And this week, I decided to reread the Christmas story Luke 1 and 2, Matthew 1 and 2, and these just jumped out at me. I would, I would just encourage everyone to reread Luke 1 and 2 and Matthew 1 and 2 sometime this month. Just reread the Christmas story. But you'll see these seven prophecies. And so I want you to think about this. Prophecy is God speaking. We know for sure God spoke these seven prophecies because they're in the Bible. And so prophecy is God speaking. So what was God speaking at the time of his son's birth. And we can look at these seven prophecies. And there's one word that jumps out with each prophecy. And that's how I, I got the idea, the seven words of Christmas. So I want to show you these seven words, all right? So here's number one. First word is salvation. Salvation. This is the prophecy given to Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist. Now, just to give you a little background story, Zacharias is married to Elizabeth, and Elizabeth is barren. Zacharias is praying for her to have a child. And then an angel of the Lord comes one day when he's in the temple and says, your prayers have been heard, and Elizabeth will conceive and have a child. Now, I think Zacharias was a wise man because of what he said. He actually said to the angel, how can this be, seeing that I am old and my wife is advanced in years? He didn't use the word old. So, all right. So, anyway, she, she, then he says, because you didn't believe, you're going to be mute until your son's born. Now, remember, uh, Mary asked the same question, but she believed. Abraham asked the same question, he believed. So, the angel knew Zacharias' heart. So, he's mute, and he can't speak until John's born. And they asked Elizabeth, what, what's his name? She said, his name is John. They said, well, nobody in your family is named John. And so Zacharias comes in, but he can't speak, so he gets something to write with, and he writes his name is John. As soon as he writes it, he can speak. And that's where we're going to pick up the story, all right? Luke 1, verse 67. Now, his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. Blessed. Now, I don't have time to go into all of this, but these seven words, one of the words is blessed. And so these seven words, that's in another prophecy but they're redundant through other prophecies as well. So blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he's visited and redeemed, that's another one of the words, it's in another prophecy, his people, and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. The, notice the word salvation. And then there's more prophecy, but we don't have time to read all of it, so please go back and read it. Verse 76 says, and you child will be called the prophet of the highest. He's prophesying over his son, John. For you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins. Here's what I want to say about Christmas. Don't forget that Christmas represents salvation. It's God sending his son to save us from our sin. That's the main priority message of Christmas. His name is Jesus. It says he'll be called Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, Jesus is a derivative of Yeshua. Yeshua in the Hebrew, Jesus be the Greek. Yeshua, Y-E, which is a derivative in the Hebrew of Joshua. But Joshua's name was not Joshua at birth. This is the Joshua that served Moses. There were two Joshuas, only two Joshuas in the Old Testament. One was the one that led him into the promised land. The other was the high priest when they came out of exile. So those are the only two Joshuas. But his name was not Joshua at birth. His name was Hoshea, H-O-S-H-E-A, Hoshea. 
Moses added the J on the front of it, which is the name of God, Jehovah, and made it Jehoshua, which had just formed into Joshua, okay? But Hoshea means salvation or saves. Je, Jehovah, means God. So God saves is what Joshua means. Why then did God, though, change the O to an E and make it Yeshua? And I'm using the English letters now so we understand, but in Hebrew and Greek, it's Yeshua. Why did he do that? Here's why. Because it's referring directly to God, and it's referring to his name, I am. So here's what Jesus actually means. I am God, your salvation. That's one of the reasons that the Pharisees got so mad, because Jesus would say, I am the door. I am the way. I am the good shepherd. I am. Every time he was saying it, he was saying, I'm God, the door. I'm God, the bread. I'm God, the way. Every time. This is what Jesus is. He is salvation. Please don't ever forget that Jesus is our salvation. That Christmas, as busy as it gets, all the Christmas, all the presents, all the things that go on, don't forget it's salvation. When uh, Debbie and I first got married, we lived in a, a mobile home. And uh, so uh, every now and then we have a little saying where we remind ourselves of the goodness of God and we'll say, we've come a long way since the trailer. This isn't the trailer, you know. And uh, so the other day she said to me, you know, this isn't the trailer. And I said, no, it's not. And it reminds us of God's goodness in our lives. But you have to remember that when we got married, I wasn't saved. I didn't get saved until nine months after we got married. And so the other day, she said to me, you know, if you hadn't gotten saved, we probably wouldn't still be together. And I said, yeah, I've thought about that before. And then she said, but I want you to know that since you got saved, I could live in a trailer with you again. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? <laughs> All the women, oh, all the men are like, so what's the point? So, okay, <laughs> all right. So number one, first word of Christmas is salvation. Here's the second word, favor. Favor, this is the prophecy given to Mary. Luke 1, verse 26, now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come into the end, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed. Again, the word blessed. Are you coming? Are you among women? But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, at this saying, and consider what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Well, what's the word favor mean? Well, let me, let me help you some with this. And again, I like to go back to the original language. Again, the Old Testament written in Hebrew, New Testament written in Greek. Greek was the most precise language of the day. And that's why I believe God chose for it to be written in Greek. But the word favor here is actually the Greek word charis. Now, you've heard this word. Some of you have daughter's name, charis. charis. It's the Greek word for grace. Only six times of the New Testament is it translated favor. 130 times it's translated grace. Now, the reason I told you that is so you could understand simply what he was saying and know what favor really is. Favor is grace. For you have found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Genesis 6, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Grace. We, that, that, I just want to remind you, this is something God was speaking when his son was born. He spoke salvation, and then he spoke Grace, I want you to understand, this is the season, the time of grace. You've entered into a time of grace, which means God has you as one of his favorites. You need to know, by the way, you can have more than one favorite. You know, in our family, we always joke around about which child is the favorite. We say you're all favorites. And here's what the word favorite means, by the way. Favorite means one on whom favor rests. I was asked one time, this guy said, what, what's your favorite food? I said, uh, boy, that'd be tough. Um, he said, well, do you like Mexican food? Oh, I said, I love Mexican food. I think Mexican food's my favorite. He said, well, do you like Italian? I said, I really like Italian food. I think Italian food is my favorite. He said, do you like Chinese? Oh, I said, I could eat Chinese all day. I love, he said, I, I, I figured out your problem. Anyway, <laughs> my problem is I have more than one favorite, and God has more than one 
favorites. So again, in all the busyness and the hustle and the bustle of the season, don't forget it's God's favorite. They, they asked me last week for a video they were shooting around here. They said, what are your favorite Christmas lights? I said, the tail lights when everybody goes home. All right, so anyway, <laughs> I'm sorry. Grandchildren, the only people you love to see come and you love to see go. Um, <clears throat> just because we're tired. We're just tired. That's why we don't have kids at this age, all right? All right, so that's number two. Number three, three the third word, blessed. This is the prophecy given through Elizabeth. Some were given to the people, some were given through the people. This one was given through Elizabeth. Luke 1, verse 39. Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the Mar greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke. So here's prophetic utterance. She's filled with the Spirit. Then she speaks. By the way, John the Baptist was filled with the Spirit this time too because one of the part of the prophecy to Zacharias, which we didn't get to read, was he'll be filled with the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb. And Zacharias, the father, was filled with the Holy Spirit. So she's filled with the Holy Spirit, and then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. You can see how as I read these prophecies, these words just jumped out. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy, blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. So, blessed. What's the Greek word for blessed? I told you this a while back, but it's makarios. It means happy. I'd love to get the definition because we talk about being blessed or blessings, and the word blessed means happy. Jesus came to make you happy. I know he came to give us joy, and that's one of the seven words, but he came to make you happy. There's a lie of Satan that if you give your life to Jesus, you'll never be happy again. And people say it this way, well, I want to have fun. Please hear me. I've been on the other side. It's not fun. There's not happiness with it. There's not true joy. There's nothing that lasts. If you, people say, well, I'm going to live my life because I want to have fun, and then at the end, right before I die, I'll give my life to the Lord. You're not going to be happy, though. Because happiness, blessings, comes from Jesus. Acts chapter 3, Peter's preaching to the Jews, and this is what he says in verse 26. To you first, having God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him, if you want to know why God sent Jesus, sent him to bless you, to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. So Jesus came to bless you. Now, um, if you notice, because there are seven points, the, the rhythm is going to be a little different than my normal messages because I have normally have three points. And this is the reason I wanted to say this. Uh, I thought about whether do I want to take the time. It's going to take me about a minute to say it, and I've got seven points, so I want to take the time to say it. I do because I want to teach you something. You're used to my preaching, so you're used to my rhythm. I do three points normally. And I, 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 on every point, some of you will recognize this, some of you, you'll think, oh, I never thought about that. I, I use explanation, application, and illustration. In other words, I explain to you what the Scripture said, I apply it to our lives, and then I illustrate it. And so you're used to that. This message has a little different rhythm because there's seven, so I can't use, I can't go this, this, the same rhythm where each point has eight to ten minutes. Each point now has four to five minutes. You say, well, why are you taking the time in the middle of a message to tell us this? Here's why. Because other pastors come in and preach, and they don't have the rhythm that I have the same rhythm. Not that mine's the best. It is, but not that it is. <laughs> but we're used to it. So I just wanted to say, I just want to take a moment as your pastor and teach you when someone else stands at the pulpit, and you're a little off balance because you think, well, I didn't even catch the person's first point. I don't know where he is right now and what's good, you know. Just try to forget about that rhythm and just hear the truth that's coming. You follow me? And I also want to remind you that we have our first conference coming up. We always have great speakers at first, but they may not have the same rhythm that I have, but we're going to hear God. So when a person stands up to speak the Word of God, we're going to hear the Word of God. 
so that my rhythm is just going to be a little different. So I don't have much time to develop each point is what I'm saying. But this is the third word, grace. Here's the fourth word, guidance. And this is through the prophecies given to Joseph, guidance. Now, the word guidance is actually not in the text, but it's what jumps out at me as I read these four prophetic words. It's three scriptures, but four prophetic words. Matthew 1, verse 19. Now we're in Matthew 1. Then we'll go back to Luke 2 in just a minute. Matthew 1, verse 19. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Then Jesus is born. Then they're about to go back home. And verse chapter 2, verse 13, now when they departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And then look at verse 19. Now when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the young child's life are dead. Then he arose, took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. I like this because he had a little sense that something wasn't right. And being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. The, these prophetic words are amazing. But this is what I get out of these prophetic words to Joseph, that God's going to guide me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to be upset and, and have anxiety going through life because Jesus came. One of the things that God was speaking when Jesus came was that he's going to give us guidance. He'll warn us if he has to, even in a dream. But he'll tell us where to go, when to move to another city, when to take another job, which city to move to, which school district put our kids in. God's going to guide us. I hope you're catching this message, even though we can't spend much time on each point, because this is what Christmas means. God came to bless us. He came to give us grace. He came to give us salvation, but he also came so that he could guide us every day for the blessing and the benefit of our families. And that's what he did with Joseph. Uh, it's kind of like GPS, you know, <laughs> global positioning system. But spiritually, I would call it guidance protection services. <laughs> guidance protection services. God's going to bless you. Now, Debbie makes fun of me with GPS because I, I don't listen all the time. And so I miss the turns. And so the, the, the word that we hear most is recalculating. <laughs> recalculating. Recalculating. One time the GPS said to me, pull over and let me drive. <laughs> Actually, that was Debbie that said that. But anyway, it was still a woman's voice. I just knew I heard those words. And so just just recount here's when what's great about god is he'll speak to us now think about this too you say boy he spoke a lot in dreams he still speaks through dreams but they didn't have the bible with them all the time they didn't have it on their phone they didn't have it in their homes it was only in the temple so he did speak a lot through dreams but god speaks a lot through his word think about that we have the word of god not only in book form, most of us have it with us at all times, and we don't even read it. And God might want to be speaking something to you while you're waiting in the doctor's office. And you could just take a few moments and read God's Word. But He still speaks prophetically, and He still speaks through dreams. I had a dream one night that um, Debbie and I were driving along, and I saw a group of guys beating up a guy. And I handed her my phone and said, call 911. And I got out of the car and started running toward them and shouting. And they ran away. And I cradled this guy in my arms. He had like a mask pulled over his face. And I lifted the mask up, and it was one of my friends. 
And so I called him the next morning and told him about the dream. And I said, I think Satan's attacking you right now. And I need you to be honest with me. He's attacking me in the area of my marriage right now. See, God speaks. He wanted to bring a warning, and he wanted to give guidance because he speaks. He still speaks today. So that's number four. Here's number five, joy. The fifth word, joy. This was given to the shepherds back in Luke 2 now, Luke 2, verse 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. And then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, great joy, which will be to all people. This word joy, again, is interesting in the original language because it means the cause of or the reason of joy. Not just the fruit of joy, but the cause or the reason of joy. You've heard the old saying, saying, Jesus is the reason for the season. Well, it does rhyme, but he is. He really is the reason for the season. And without Jesus in your season, you don't have joy. You won't have joy. But the great thing about joy is that it doesn't depend on your circumstances. It's shocking to me that Satan never takes a break. I don't know if you ever noticed that, but as a pastor, I've had to say to many people who've gone through a tragedy... You need to be aware that Satan attacks during tragedies. You would think that when a family has a tragedy, Satan would just say, I'm just going to leave them alone for a minute. They have enough bad things right now. But he doesn't. He attacks. And one of the times that Satan attacks the most is Christmas. 
supposed to be one of the most joyous times of the year, and yet many, many people have tremendous sadness during this time. And there are reasons. A lot of times it's based around family. Maybe there's a separation in the family. If one of the family members isn't there. Maybe there was a loss of someone, and I'm not trying to be insensitive if you've gone through something like that. But there's someone's not at the table this year. Maybe there's a health crisis that you're going through or that you learned about, or there's a financial crisis. Something's going on. I remember one time I was doing a a funeral for someone, and as I was preparing, the Lord gave me this statement. Christians are the only people in the world that can legitimately grieve and rejoice at the same time. (laughs) Because when we lose someone, it's okay to grieve. There's a time to grieve. But even in that grief, here's what the Bible says, but we don't grieve like those who have no hope. So even in grief, you can have joy. No matter what you're going through this Christmas, you can have joy. That's one of the words of Christmas is joy. You can have joy even if your circumstances aren't right. When our kids were young one Christmas, um, we had a car repair and I think a washing machine or something, but a lot of finances uh, went out. And I, didn't, I don't believe in putting things on a credit card if you can't pay the card at the end of the month, you know. And so uh, I was upset that, you know, wasn't going to have any money for Christmas. And I was having my quiet time, and I was just kind of going through the motions, you know. And the Lord said to me, why don't you just go ahead and say it? And I said, okay, I'm mad at you. He said, I know. Why are you mad at me? I said, well, because we don't have any money for Christmas. And you don't even care. That's why I'm mad at you. So he said, so what does that mean that you don't have money for Christmas? I said, well, you know what it means. I said, we're not going to be able to have Christmas this year. And you know how you say something and you regret it as soon as you say it? (laughs) He said, oh, really? You know, you're not going to be able to have Christmas because you don't have money. You're not going to be able to celebrate my son's birth because of a lack of money. Money is what you gauge your joy on. Is that what you're telling me? I said, not now. (laughs) But the Lord readjusted my perspective. And I remember God spoke to me about I thought, well, I want want to give my kids gifts. And the Lord spoke to me. And when I said gifts, I thought about spiritual gifts. So the Lord spoke to me a a spiritual gift that we could give each of the children, lay hands on them and pray over them. And I remember God still provided for presents. God's always faithful. We gave him some presents that year. But then I spoke to him about, I'm going to give each of you a gift. And I prayed over him and gave him a gift. Do you know to this day, our kids remember that Christmas more than any Christmas growing up because it wasn't about all the other stuff. I also remember I got a call from the principal and said, hey, your kids have really made a stir in the school. Everyone, they went around the class, they were talking about what they got. Your son talked about he got this gift, the gift of leadership from you. And they went home and they told their parents, I want the gift of leadership. (laughs) So, all right, here's number six. Redemption. This was given uh, through Anna, a prophetess at the temple. Luke 2, verse 36. Now, there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel. Phanuel is a a derivative of the Hebrew word penal, which means face-to-face with God. It's where Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord all night. Of the tribe of Asher, she was of great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. Now, there's some numbers, so we'll add them up in a moment, all right? And this woman was a widow of about 84 years, who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayer night and day. And coming in that instant, I, I like how the Bible says at that exact time, because you're going to see a moment, something else happened like that, and I just think it's too much of a coincidence. Coming in, in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in 
Jerusalem. Now, first of all, let's just talk about uh, her age. Um, she, if she got married at 14, which would not have been uh, uncommon in that time, but if she got married later than that, then she was actually older. So I'm saying she was at least how old I'm going to get to, all right? So if she got married at 14 and she lived with her husband seven years, then she'd have been 21 when he died. Then she was at the temple for 84 years. She was a widow for 84 years, so she was at least 105 years old. Now, why am I saying that? We're going to talk about Simeon in a moment because Simeon, tradition, the Bible doesn't tell us, but tradition tells us he was 112. So he's 112 and she's 105. The reason I wanted to say that is you're never too old to be used by God. God chose two old people to prophesy over his son. (laughs) I mean, really old. 105 and 112. And she prophesies redemption. So what does redemption mean? You got to think about the word redeem. First of all, deem has to do with value. Like, what do you deem the value of that to be? What do you deem, how, to, how much do you deem that to be? So it's about buying or purchasing. But when you put re in front of it, it means to purchase it again or to buy it back. It's like the word restore. You don't just store it, you restore it. It's like the word renew, to renew your mind. It means to make your mind new again. It has to do with a second time. Redeem. God came to buy you back because you, we were his in the garden. We talked about this in the family. Adam and Eve, sons of God, the daughter of God, and yet lost. So Jesus came to repurchase what was already his. You follow me? That's what the redeem means. Now, there's a great example of this in the Bible. It's the book of Hosea. And it's mainly chapter 1 and chapter 3 if you want the the physical example on this earth. So in Hosea 1, God tells Hosea, you go buy uh, a wife who's a prostitute. And he uses the word take. Take a wife who's a prostitute and he buys her. He pays an amount for her. And he takes a woman named Gomer and she lives with him and has three children with him. They have three children together. After the three children, she leaves and goes back into prostitution. And in chapter 3, God says to him, you go buy her again. This is the word redeem. You go redeem her. Even though she left, you go get her back. It's, it's a prophetic picture of Israel that they left God, and God said, no, I'm going to go redeem them. I'm going to bring them back. I came, Jesus said, for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So I'm going to go get them back. But here's what it says to me. It says that even when I leave, even when I make a mistake, even when I go back in to the sin that I might have come out of or fall or blow it, he's there to redeem me.
He's there to bring me back. It also uses another word in chapter 3. And again, it's just one of those things that jumps out at me when I read Scripture. Chapter 1 says, take a wife. Chapter 3 says, and love a wife. You go lay your life down for her, Hosea. And then you tell Israel, this is what I'm doing for you. And it's a prophetic picture of Jesus coming to redeem us, to buy us back. And here's the seventh word, peace. Peace. And this was given through Simeon. Peace. Verse 25 of Luke 2, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation, this could also be translated comfort or peace, of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he'd seen the Lord's Christ. Watch, watch again this divine coincidence. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. And this is the exact time when the, Joseph and Mary get there. By the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said... Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. And, of course, God told the shepherds peace on earth also. Peace. Jesus came to bring peace. And I want to go into just a little more of what Simeon said in just a moment. I also want you to notice not only did he use people no matter what their age, because Mary was very young and in Simeon very old, but he spoke to a group of people. That's the shepherds. But then, maybe you've never thought about this. Remember, there are seven, but he spoke to a group of people. So out of the six, he spoke to three men and three women. Zacharias, Joseph, and Simeon, Anna, Mary, and Elizabeth. And why am I saying that? Because there's no male or female in Christ. That's why. I'm, I'm telling you, Jesus came to set things right in the world that came from the curse of the fall. Any type of discrimination, he came to set it right. So he speaks to three men and three women. And he speaks through Simeon, peace. Now, he's going to speak a prophetic word directly to Mary. And I think it has to do with peace as well. Watch this, verse 33. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. against. Now watch this. It's, it's in parentheses and it is parenthetical in the Greek as well. Yes. Strange that he starts with this word. Yes. A sword will pierce through your own soul also. Then he picks up what he was saying. That the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Here's what he's saying. Jesus is coming as a fall for the fall and rising. I mean, the fall is like a, stone, a stumbling stone. So I, I see as a preacher, I see three. I see the stone, the sign, and the sword in this passage. But he's talking about many are going to fall because of this. He's going to reveal the thoughts of many hearts through your son. And I think Mary starts picking up on it's not going to all be roses. There are going to be some thorns. And she starts realizing something because right in the middle of his sentence, he stops and he looks right in her eyes and he says, yes. A sword's even going to pierce your own soul. You remember Mary was standing at the cross when Jesus was crucified. We know she was there because he addresses her. He tells her that he's going to go home with John. John's now your son. He says to John, this is now your mother, which also means that Joseph, her husband, had died. Because Jesus wouldn't have told her to go home with another man if her father, if her husband still been alive, his father. You follow me? So she loses her husband, becomes a widow, and, she, and then she loses her son. And he says, yes, a sword is going to pierce. We also know that Mary was alive in 70 AD when Jerusalem fell. So she also saw the fall of Jerusalem. And this is all being prophesied. By the way, just so you know, these prophecies are too right on to not be God. Just all amazing that they all coordinate. But he speaks to her and says, but listen to me. Here's what he's trying to say through Christmas. Even though you're going to go through difficulties, you can still have peace. Because the Prince of Peace has come. 
This Christmas, as um, Debbie and I have, it's different, I guess, because of what happened in the spring with my health. Started around Thanksgiving and uh, just kind of hit both of us and we started talking about that we were thankful that I was there for Thanksgiving and that we're thankful I'm here for Christmas. We've done um, a lot of interviews since, um, you know, since the health crisis. And um, Debbie, um, you know, they, all, they want Debbie to be on the program as well. And just to let you know, I, I started doing television when I was 20 years old. So television to me is not anything other than just ministering to people. Um, but Debbie doesn't like to do television things. Some of you might not want to be on television either. I don't know. Um, but they all, everyone has wanted Debbie to be on every interview since, you know, since this thing. And because they want to ask her a question. And, of course, then I have to, they say, you know, can your wife be with you? Because we want to talk to her too. And I say yes. And then I have to go home and break the news <laughs> to her. She would actually rather, uh, you know, get a root canal without anesthesia, you know, than, <laughs> than do this. But they all want to ask her a question. How did you get through this? How did you feel when the paramedics told you that his blood pressure was too low to register and they could not get a pulse? How did you feel when you had to drive back to the hospital? How did you feel when you had to go in for another surgery? How did you feel when they said, it's life or death? How did you get through this? This is what she said every time. I, I was concerned but I had a supernatural peace. She had peace because Jesus came into this world 2,000 years ago. We get salvation. We get favor. We get blessings. We get guidance. We get joy. We get redemption. And we get peace. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And just like we do every weekend, would you just take a moment And just ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me through this message? Just just take a moment. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me through this message? Maybe one of these words or maybe two or three really jump out at you and you say to the Lord, Lord, that's what I need this Christmas. I need salvation. I need to give my life to you. I need to be redeemed. I need peace. I need joy. I need your grace. I need your favor. What do, you, what do you need from God? We want to pray with you. No matter what you're going through, if you're going through any type of difficulty in any area of your life, don't ever come to church and need prayer and not get prayer. If you come to church and you need prayer, it's just a few more minutes. Just take a moment. In just a moment, we're going to have a One more worship song at every campus. And we're all going to stand, so it'll be easy for you to just slip out to the aisle and come to the front, wherever you are, whichever campus where you are, and just ask someone for prayer. These people are members. They're trained. They're leaders. They love you. They want to pray with you. You're not a big, bad person because you asked for prayer. We all need prayer. So if you need prayer for any area of your life, as we come into this, go into this Christmas season, when as soon as we stand up, you just stand up, step out and come, and just tell someone this, I, I just need you to pray with me, all right? Holy Spirit, I pray you'll draw every person from every campus that has any prayer need right now, in Jesus' name, amen.